We have already learnt about the octet rule, which says that main group elements react to obtain eight electrons in their valence shell. They do this in one of two ways. They can either undergo electron transfer by losing electrons or gaining electrons to form ions, or they share electrons and form covalent bonds, so each atom ends up with eight electrons in its valence shell, giving it the same stable electron configuration as a noble gas. The octet rule only applies to S and P electrons. A few exceptions are the first few elements on the periodic table, like hydrogen, which is stable with a full duet in its valence shell, and those elements like boron, which form stable compounds with an incomplete octet. We have also learned that the Vespa molecular geometry of a covalent molecule depends on the number of electron domains around a central atom and their type, whether bonding or non-bonding. Thirdly, we've learned how the molecule shape influences bond angles. Some main group elements in the P block, however, specifically those in period 3 and below, can have more than 8 electrons in their outer shell and can form other molecular geometries. The elements more commonly known to have the ability to accommodate more than 8 electrons in their valence shells are phosphorus, sulfur, arsenic, selenium, antimony, tellurium, bromine, chlorine and iodine, and even the noble gas, xenon. More than eight electrons in a valence shell is called an expanded octet. The reason why these elements can have more than eight electrons in their valence shell is that the energy of their valence D subshell orbitals is very similar to that of the other valence subshell orbitals. There is a small energy gap. Let's use sulfur as an example whose valence shell is the third energy level. When forming certain compounds, it can use empty d orbitals to accommodate additional electrons. This is an oversimplification, but we can use this model to understand how sulfur can now potentially form six electron pairs when it bonds, or four bonds if two of sulfur's electrons form a lone pair. Either way, after bonding, sulfur has an expanded octet. And so sulfur and the other atoms which can form expanded octets can therefore have five or even six electron domains. Five electron domains will orientate themselves in a trigonal bipyramidal electron domain arrangement. The molecular shape will depend on how many of these electron domains are bonding and how many are non-bonding. Whether there are five bonding domains or four bonding domains and one non-bonding, three bonding and two non-bonding, or only two bonding and three non-bonding. Let's look at specific examples of each. Two classic examples of compounds which have five electron domains are phosphorus pentachloride and sulfur tetrafluoride. We can determine their molecular geometries by first determining their Lewis structures using the usual rules plus one extra rule. Let's do this for these two compounds. We first count the total number of valence electrons. Phosphorus has five and each chlorine has seven. This gives a total of 40 valence electrons. Placing phosphorus at the center with the chlorines around it, we can form five single bonds. This uses up 10 electrons. Next, we complete the octets of the outer atoms. In this case, each chlorine will receive three lone pairs to complete their octets. This uses up a further 30 valence electrons. There are no more valence electrons to use, and so this is the Lewis structure of phosphorus pentachloride. We can see phosphorus has more than eight valence electrons, since it has five bonds, it has 10 valence electrons. It has an expanded octet. If we do the same for the second compound, after filling in the bonds and the octets of the outer atoms, 
we have used up 32 of the 34 valence electrons. There are still two valence electrons to use. Here is the new rule. It says that we can use the remaining electrons as lone pairs on the central atom to form an expanded octet. Sulfur has 10 valence electrons, 8 in bonds and 2 in a lone pair. It has an expanded octet. Let's remove the lone pairs on the outer atoms for simplicity since we are focusing on the central atoms. Both compounds have five electron domains around the central atom. However, phosphorus has five bonding domains, while sulfur has four and one non-bonding domain. Electron domains repel each other in such a way as to minimize the distance between them and thus minimize the overall repulsion. In phosphorus pentachloride, all electron domains are equivalent since they are all bonding domains. Equivalent electron domains repel each other equally. This results in a trigonal bipyramidal electron domain geometry as well as a trigonal bipyramidal molecular geometry. Then in sulfur tetrafluoride, the electron domains are not equivalent. The lone pair exerts a greater repulsion than do the bond pairs. The electron domain geometry is trigonal bipyramidal, but turning the molecule on its side and focusing only on the atoms and bonds and not the lone pair, we can see that the molecular geometry is seesaw. Here are another two compounds with five electron domains. Chlorine trifluoride has three bonding domains and two lone pairs on the central atom. It has a trigonal bipyramidal electron domain geometry because it has five electron domains, but a T-shaped molecular geometry which is easier to see if we remove the lone pairs. While the I3- ion has three lone pairs on the central atom and only two single bonds. Again, because of the five electron domains on the central atom, this results in a trigonal bipyramidal electron domain geometry. The three lone pairs spread equally in the equatorial plane and the bonds stick out in the axial plane. Don't get confused, we have drawn the ball and stick model perpendicular to the Lewis structure to clearly show the two planes, which are usually drawn in this orientation by convention. Removing the lone pairs for clarity, we get a linear molecular shape. We can summarize the four molecular geometries which arise from five electron domains in a table like before. And we can add in the bond angles too. Now let's investigate six electron domain molecules. Six electron domains will orientate themselves in an octahedral electron domain arrangement. Again, the molecular shape will depend on how many of these domains are bonding and the number which are non-bonding. Whether there are six bonding domains, five bonding and one non-bonding, or four bonding and two non-bonding. These two compounds both have expanded octets on the central atom with 12 valence electrons and six electron domains. Again, let's remove the lone pairs on the outer atoms for clarity. Sulfur hexafluoride has no lone pair, but six equivalent bonding electron domains. They repel each other equally, forming an octahedral electron domain geometry and an octahedral molecular geometry. In bromine pentafluoride, however, one of the domains is non-bonding. Although the electron domain geometry is octahedral, removing the lone pair, we can see the molecular geometry is square pyramidal. Then xenon tetrafluoride has two non-bonding domains and four bonding domains. Again, the electron domain geometry is octahedral, but the most stable structure formed from repulsion by the two lone pairs is a square planar molecular shape. 
And so these are the Vesper geometries of molecules with six electron domains. And here are their bond angles. Using these molecules as examples, we can deduce the overall polarity and thus solubility in the usual way. The overall polarity of any molecule, including those with five and six electron domains, is deduced by examining the polarity of individual bonds as well as the overall molecular shape. In each of these examples, all bonds are polar because of the highly electronegative fluorine atoms. But the first and third compounds are nonpolar since their bonds are equally distributed in space around the central atom or are all in one plane. While the central compound, bromine pentafluoride, has a net dipole moment because of the shape of the molecule with a fluorine at the apex of the pyramid. This results in a polar compound which is soluble in water. Although this particular compound happens to also react with water violently as it dissolves. So far we have used Lewis structures to deduce molecular geometry. However, certain compounds such as sulfur dioxide have more than one possible Lewis structure because it displays resonance. And in this case, sulfur in the third structure has an expanded octet. To deduce which is the preferred structure and consider the most stable, we use a concept called formal charge. Formal charge is the charge on an atom in a molecule if all the atoms had the same electronegativity and all bonds were purely covalent. Formal charge helps us understand how electrons are distributed amongst the atoms in a molecule. Ideally, the best Lewis structure has the smallest possible formal charge on each atom, with the charges as close to zero as possible. We can use this equation to calculate the formal charge on an atom in a molecule. V is the number of valence electrons on a particular atom. N the number of non-bonding valence electrons on that atom, and b the number of electrons shared in bonds to that atom. Let's calculate the formal charge on the leftmost structure. We'll start with oxygen. Looking at this oxygen atom, it has six valence electrons. It has six non-bonding electrons in three lone pairs and two shared bonding electrons in its bond. This gives a formal charge of minus one. Doing a similar calculation for each of the other atoms in this structure gives a formal charge of plus one for sulfur and zero for the oxygen on the right. The sum of the formal charges of a neutral molecule must equal zero. Then doing the same calculation for the atoms in the other two structures, we get these formal charges. The third structure is the preferred one since it has the lowest formal charges. Its electron distribution makes it more stable than the other two structures. As a side note, from the video on resonance, we know that in reality all resonance structures contribute to the true structure that is, the resonance hybrid. The Lewis structure with the most stable state, however, will contribute more. In this next example, these are the possible Lewis structures for dinitrogen monoxide or nitrous oxide, where each atom has a full octet. And here are the formal charges. The sum of the formal charges for both molecules is zero. And so, to deduce which structure is preferred, we need to select the one where the negative formal charge is on the more electronegative atom. Oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, and in the first structure, oxygen has a negative formal charge. And so this is the preferred structure. Both formal charge and oxidation state are models used to understand electron or charge distribution in compounds, but they are used for different purposes. 
oxidation state treats compounds as if they were ionic and helps us understand charge transfer in redox reactions. While formal charge treats all bonds as covalent and helps us understand the stability of molecules. Together, both tools are used to understand the reactivity, bonding and stability of a chemical species. Now let's summarize what we've learned. We learned that main group elements in period 3 and below are capable of using their d orbitals in bonding and can therefore have an expanded valence octet with more than 8 electrons. An atom in a molecule with 10 valence electrons forms five electron domains, which orientate themselves in a trigonal bipyramidal arrangement. While 12 valence electrons form six electron domains, which orientate themselves in an octahedral arrangement. The molecular geometries, however, depend on the number of bonding and non-bonding domains. When a molecule has more than one possible Lewis structure, formal charge is calculated to deduce the most stable and most likely structure. The most stable Lewis structure is the one whose formal charges are as close to zero as possible.